Hey everybody, welcome to the Allison Park Leadership Podcast, where we discuss the principles behind the plans. I'm Dave. And my name is Jeff, and we want to welcome you, and we'll just say this is the last episode before Dave becomes a dad. Come on, somebody. That, actually, by the time this comes out, I will be a dad, yes. almost certainly. I guess there's a chance it uh, come very late. So, so yeah. we're, what, five days away from due date or something like that Something today. like that. So it could be any minute. Yeah, in fact, if Dave report. leaves in the middle of this podcast, you'll know why. That's if possible. I, <laughs> I don't know if this would air if that happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so let's introduce ourselves a little bit more. If you are a regular listener, of course, you know we're at the, the church in Pittsburgh, a multi-campus church called Allison Park Church. Dave is one of the campus pastors at the Northside Campus, and I've been the lead pastor here for 31 years. We're also father and son. And we have some recognitions, right? Shout outs to give yeah. today. We especially want to thank anybody who's up to five star review in Apple Podcasts. And today we have one to thank. Shout out to K M Yount, I guess. K M Y Out. I don't know how you pronounce that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, and, and as always, we, we just want to say for the faithful listeners, we are so glad that you're a part of the show. Um, you really do make this worth doing, and, and we appreciate your feedback and suggestions. Yeah. And if you ever want to get a shout-out, just leave us a five-star review. Um, it helps us to spread the word, and we would love to give yeah. you a personal thank you. And so. the podcast has a YouTube channel. You can watch it there. Uh, if you go there, there's uh, a way for, for some engagement, too. We've had some comments there just recently. So we love the discussions and the input that come from that, or any suggestions you have. So... Thank you so much for that. We're all about it. Can you believe we're almost at the end of the year for season I know, three? man. Season three. It feels like we just started this, really. I know. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I have I have truly enjoyed hearing from people really all over the place. I'll, I'll visit someplace, and I'll, so I was actually in Africa, <laughs> <laughs> and I was just finishing teaching at a, at a graduation ceremony for church planners, and the missionary came up and said, Loved your episode on Stranger Things. <laughs> and I was like, wow, it's so cool. So, <laughs> you know, so man, we really appreciate uh, those of you who, who listen and also let us know. Yeah, mm -hmm. very much so. So today we are going to be talking about uh, someone that's come up in conversation a few times recently, you know, with some of our um, Alice Park Leadership Academy students and things like that. We're going to be talking about what's so wrong with the prosperity gospel. Yeah which is something you probably hear all about. I mean, it's a buzzword today. There are lots of mainline, mainstream pastors that are accused of being Well, it is un a universally pastors. sort of despised uh, concept, the mm. prosperity gospel and prosperity teachers. It's almost like what it was in my era, the tele-evangelist, right? Yeah, so right. When, you talk, when you said, oh, that guy's a tele-evangelist, then you associated something negative with that, or prosperity gospel, of course, that's today's. Or mega church is another one of those buzzwords that people often have negative views about. But we're sp specifically going to get into some of the theological backdrop of what the prosperity gospel is, and then talk a little bit of, okay, from my perspective, some balanced thinking on it. So, great. Yeah. So maybe do we want to start with? What is the prosperity yeah, gospel? Yeah, well, so now let me ask you, because you've been sort of studying this out to describe it. So what is, what is, Dave, the prosperity gospel? You're giving me too much so... credit. That, this, is like, <laughs> this is like a 15-minute session of reading articles before I got on air for this. Yeah, I mean, the prosperity gospel is basically a teaching that as a part of the covenant that we have with God, that we are almost owed health and wealth, is what it's they say. It's a good say. word, owed, yep. Yeah. That that it's it's a part of our, our covenant promise, and often there's some some, often there's some monetary. If you give God your money or whatever, that God will actually bless you materially more than 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 you gave. It's right. like give to get your miracle, give to get your Lamborghini, give to get your promotion or or whatever it might be. So it's it's the under undercurrent of, of all of this is if you are a real follower of Jesus and if, if you have faith if you have if you've generated enough which, faith which you trigger by some type of financial investment in someone's ministry a seed sown into that ministry that you'll be able to tell because of the financial and material yeah. blessings that are in Often somebody's you, life you hear it quoted you know 30 60 100 fold you'll get 100 times back what you put in and it's almost like a uh uh, sort of a, I don't know, you call a Ponzi scheme or a, a get rich quick kind of philosophy that give and you'll be, it'll be given to you is what the Bible says. And so it's almost like this um, numerical, mathematical 
output expectation. And for, uh, and for what it's worth, it really is a not just a Western theology. It's really something that kind of came up in America. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Specifically. Yeah. Yeah, sometime I was reading, sometime after World War II, um, it's not necessarily a Pentecostal charismatic doctrine, but it, it kind of came out of that movement. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know? Yeah. And it's not that all churches are... Meaning it's not a, a uh, what you would call a historic sound traditional doctrine, orthodox but it is doctrine, it did grow right? out of that root system yeah absolutely yep yep yeah and so there is this feeling that too that then you can tell if someone's blessed or not by how much money they have and the results of their life uh, how healthy they are how prosperous they are it's sort of if there's any kind of teaching that fits with Americanism yeah <laughs> or the American culture it would be yeah, yeah it right. would be the prosperity gospel because this is sort of like the, uh, you know, the American dream. God will bless your life and give you the American dream, uh, which is, you know, health and wealth and blessing and the fulfillment of everything that you've desired. Now, with that, a lot of times there is this idea that then you can give to support the work of God or help people around the world um, live a healthy life, you know, those kinds of things as a part of it. Now, here, here's the side of it that even describing all this, something internally inside of me says, but there's something to this. Like, mm -hmm. it's not like we almost, people talk about this concept almost like it's it should be completely despised and has no as a, basis. As a full heresy. Yeah, yeah but sure. there is a basis for all of this in, in the scripture that if you give, you can expect God to give back and that God does want you to be healthy and that there is a, that's part of what Jesus did when he died on the cross was to provide for our healing and that we can expect that when we sow seed that we're going to reap. This is all biblical principles. Somehow it gets a bit tilted um, and that's when it get, gets, goes off. So, so, yeah, but so before, now before you, before you answer all the things, <laughs> you can preview how you feel about it. Yeah. Um, so, so what I'm saying is if you're listening to this and you have been maybe tuned into someone that is more on the prosperity side of things, and you have really been benefited by their ministry, and you're like, I didn't know that Pastor Jeff or that Allison Park Church was anti-prosperity gospel. Man, oh man, you know, so what are you saying here? Because there are a lot of people who, who um, tune into these ministries and have been benefited by them in some ways, but there's also an extreme. And and. So I don't know where you were going to go with that. Well, I was, we... I was just going to say, I think we can we can dialogue about this, the balance and what is dangerous and may, maybe what are, what's, you know, they say throw the baby out of the bathwater. What, yeah. what is the baby? If there is a baby <laughs> with, within all that mix. And then on the other flip side, I would say the, the counter argument that would be like, oh, this is traditional orthodoxy that counters historic cross. christianity right right even Sorry. preceding pentecostal charismatic right the the traditional mm -hmm. long-term sound view that a lot of people would say sp specifically in the reformed um segment of christianity would be um that the prosperity gospel is evil toxic heresy and that really like the proper perspective is a theology of suffering actually i hear that all the time yeah i don't know if you do people will be like we need to talk more about suffering yeah like, so if one <laughs> side elevates success as the sign of God's blessing. The other side elevates suffering as the as sign, the sign of, God's, of God's character. Yeah. Yeah. And sure. so so you have these two things like, no, no, it, it God doesn't care how much success you have. He only cares how much you are willing to suffer. Mm. And then the other one says, yeah, suffering is a part of life, but God wants to bring you out of that and into a place of success. And really that God so the the extreme side of prosperity would be God doesn't really ever want you to suffer. Yeah. Suffering is a part of the curse. But we it's not part of what you should have okay. ever. Good insight. And then the other side is God loves suffering yeah. <laughs> because it's so good for you and it brings him glory. And if we, even if we can't understand the purpose of suffering, God did orchestrate it because somehow, mysteriously, everything brings him glory. And, he pro and, and if it is success, it probably is something you don't deserve. And, well, yeah, yeah, and, and you should just a should not expect blessing. it at all because <laughs> yeah. So it it almost is a little bit of a depressing side that. Uh, so, so okay, yeah. So now, there has been a correction. So I would say the height of the prosperity wave came in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, when it was um, just coming to fruition. Uh, we tend to think of some of the things that came out of uh, 
Kenneth Hagin's life and Rama Bible College. I remember hearing Oral Roberts with Oral Roberts University. Oral Roberts yeah. University. So I attended uh, school college in Springfield, Missouri, where the headquarters of the Assemblies of God is. Three hours away is Tulsa, which is sort of like the center of what the the, the faith movement kind of was birthed there. And you have these two institutions, Oral Roberts and and Rama there. And I remember hearing in my Bible school classes how dangerous the Tulsa teaching was. Okay, because there was sort of that idea. Then later on, I read a lot of Kenneth Hagin's books. And actually, Kenneth Hagin's pretty biblical, solid guy. Uh, some of the people that came out of the stream, however, of the Word of Faith movement um, ended, t- ended up taking it to some extremes that even now, uh, those leaders in 2022 are, are taking a step back from. Two significant names that yeah. we were talking about beforehand. Well, one of them that I just, I didn't even realize this, but one of them that, that's kind of gotten a lot of flack, rightfully so, I mean, even to his own admission, it was Benny Hinn. Right. Who was this Israeli, really a televangelist, mm-hmm. you know, um, who was very famous for a lot of those things, like your blessing is a thousand dollars away kind of a thing. Yeah. And he just recently, a couple of years ago, came out and said, um, you know, I, I have to correct my own theology. The Holy Spirit's been on me about this. Um, you know, he, he said, like, I was slow to say this because I was worried about offending people, but I, I just have to say, you know, the gospel is too it's become too much about how you feel and materialism. The gospel is not for sale, you know, sort of coming against the, the prosperity teaching he had given, yeah. which and is then, a big turnaround. Yeah, and then the other guy is Creflo Dollar, who is a pastor of World Changers Church, about 30,000 people there in Atlanta, Georgia. And he also came out and said some of my teaching about tithing and the, you know, the command to tithe and the expectation of financial blessing when you do was probably taken to an excess. And I realize that now and I want to bring it back into balance. So Benny Hinn and Creflo Dollar, two huge names in the Word of Faith movement that now are saying there was some imbalance here that we want to want to begin to bring correction to. I think overall, there has been a moderation of some of this from the very, I would say, outset of the 2000s, a move away from some of the extremes that were a part of this before, and a balancing out of some of the teachings that would come with this. However, that doesn't, it has not slowed the uh, mocking or disdain uh, that a lot of the Christian community has for the whole concept of prosperity gospel to begin with, it's it's a pretty big theme on social media, even still. People sort of talking about the dangers of it and warning folks about it. Well, and as, as much as I, you know, am very pro, like, seeing God's supernatural ministry demonstrated, and, and you know, honestly, even, even in studying the atonement of Jesus, so one of the fallacies of the prosperity gospel is that Jesus died for your healing. Even as studying that, I'm like, I think some of this might really be true you know what i mean like uh, uh, as, as far as some of some of what happens in, in uh, prosperity teaching but what i will say is i think when it is in its full form there is a lot of danger I, I i think it does carry the risk of not helping to create real christians or real disciples people that are you know in, in it for the wrong reason they're in it because because of the blessing mm-hmm. and, and you know what i'll even say this even if we're not talking about the prosperity gospel, um, where it's give this amount and you'll be materially blessed, there it, it's even some of that uh, theology and philosophy and, and thought process has filtered its way into mainstream preaching, where so much of mainstream preaching is only about your next breakthrough, and you know it's it's kind of constant. It, it doesn't necessarily focus on the totality of carrying your cross and following Jesus. It's it's a lot on blessing and breakthrough and and overcoming and, you know, and I think that's a part of, a, a huge part of Christian theology. Mm-hmm. But when it's the main or the only part is overcoming whatever, how, how do I say this, physical, material trial you're in right now, I do think it blunts the edge of following Jesus to the fullest extent of discipleship. Yeah. So let's 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 talk about then what we do believe. Can Great. we go there? What sure. is the gospel? So let's just talk about that. Rather than the prosperity gospel, let's ask the question, so what is the gospel? Do you want to start? Okay, so we believe that Jesus Christ came into the world because he wanted to rescue us from our sin and from the curse that comes with it. So when sin entered the world, 
uh, Adam and Eve were removed from the Garden of Eden, which was the place where God's will always happened. And they were unable to, to eat of the tree that would keep them alive forever, the tree of life, because God didn't want to li- them to live forever in the condition of their damaged, sinful selves. From that moment, God has had a plan to bring redemption to us. Redemption, which is this broader word that means not just forgiveness for my sin, but restoration to the original purpose that God has for us. And so Jesus Christ came into the world on a rescue mission, rescue us from, the, from sin and the curse of sin. When he died on the cross, he paid the price for my sin and for the curse. The curse was destroyed in his body when he died on the cross. He was buried in the ground, but didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave and is alive today. And when he rose from the grave, he overturned the curse for us. Not only was our sin paid for, but the curse was broken so that now we can begin to pray the kingdom of God down on earth and the will of God down on earth and to see his will again manifest. Now, there's two places in in history where the will of God was always done. One is the Garden of Eden, and one is the kingdom of heaven when we finally get to heaven. And we live in in between that, which is still under the curse that comes with sin. So that's why we have sickness and disease and tragedies and earthquakes and disasters. And we also live in an era where the devil the Bible says, is like the prince of the power of the air and dominates most of the world, the powers of darkness. So we don't live on a beach with our, you know, easy chair, kick back, just sipping some iced tea under the favor of the Lord now because we are uh, believers in Jesus Christ that has overcome the curse. We live in still the middle of a battle zone where we are fighting every day against the powers of darkness, still in a cursed world, with people who are under the powers of darkness and need to be saved so that they can be redeemed and made whole. So the purpose here is not, now I'm saved and the curse is lifted so I can have a big house and a big car and a prosperous business. We're here now to work with Jesus on his mission on earth, which is to rescue people from the curse and from the attack of the enemy and from the pain that comes from living in a sin-cursed world. And the gospel becomes the solution for all of that. So, um, in my mind, there is breakthrough that comes with the gospel that is not just about your sin. It's about your physical healing. It's about being free from addiction. It's about expecting that God will provide for you financially so that you can fulfill his mission on earth. It It is about seeing people saved and cities transformed. It's about living in, a, in the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can fulfill his purpose on earth and bring his kingdom down where the, the will of the devil has been happening every day. We want the will of God to happen. So to me, the gospel carries all of those components with it. And so where the prosperity gospel has some things right is that there is an expectation that with the gospel comes breakthrough. In fact, there's this word that we see in the New Testament for the word save, that Jesus has come to save you from your sin or to save your soul. And it's actually the word in the Greek sozo, which implies, just like the word shalom in the Old Testament means completeness and wholeness in every way from the inside out. The word sozo means completeness and wholeness. It means mental and physical and emotional and spiritual and relational wholeness. Jesus comes to bring salvation to all aspects of your life And so when you step into faith in Christ, the gospel brings with it all of those things as a part of the package. And we should live into that and believe for all of that as we experience our life. Okay. So um, so obviously the gospel brings breakthrough. Yep. And I think the prosperity gospel will talk also about financial breakthrough, which there's there's gotta be a degree of that. Sure. You know, where Jesus talks about like don't worry about what you have to to eat or drink or are you what you clothed because God even cares about the lilies of the valley or the sparrow? Yeah, and so then he says, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be given will to be you as well. To you as well. Sure. So so there is expectation of all of those things: blessing, prosperity, breakthrough, healing. This is all part of what the gospel brings so with it. So the and I guess the question would be: is provision the same thing as prosperity? That's one thing. And then here's here's a here's a big question that I have for you because you have prosperity teachers that would teach verses from the Bible that say this is what God wants for you. And then you have people that are teaching, you know, some people would call it the poverty gospel, where God's more blessed by your poverty or suffering. But even if you don't go to an extreme, you know, it feels like two contradictory things you'll hear is God wants you to prosper or God wants you to suffer. Or maybe God doesn't want you to suffer, but God 
is totally fine with your suffering, or yeah. God may so, intentionally allow your suffering. So which, doesn't okay, it feel like those are two different things? Like, so which is it? where does the prosperity gospel get it wrong? Let's talk about that. The, there are some ic- icky factors here. One, God will bless you if you give money to me. This is what people say, right? I am here on this television station, and we're taking a telethon here. And if you sow seed into my ministry... Because there's such good soil in my ministry, God is going to bless you. So it's a little bit self-serving. God, I'm not asking you. So if no one's out there saying, if you will give money to the poor, <laughs> God will then bless you. Like, here's look, here's the poorest in society. Here are the people that are suffering the most. If you will take your finances and walk down to the homeless on the streets and start to pour out your resources to take care of the poor. No one in the prosperity teaching is doing that. They're saying, send money to me. Okay, so my church, my ministry. And so it feels a little bit like a man- manipulation. And that's part of what where it goes wrong. And then it's like, and God has done all of this, dying on the cross for you, rising from the grave, overcoming the curse, so that you can live an easy life. You can be pain-free, and you can have a big house and a big car, and you can, you can have every part of your dream. And this is why it's all there, so that you can be a spoiled kid in the kingdom of God. Okay, well, God has done all these things for you so that you can live on mission, so that you can go out into the world and you should preach the gospel to people and you should serve the poor and you should work to change the world where there's injustice. You're trying to speak up for it and change it. So you're going to use the resources that God puts in your hands and the health that God gives you, and you're going to go out and you're going to, to do that by giving it all away, or maybe not all of it, by living a sacrificial life. So God wants to fill your hands with abundance so that you can live abundantly and live a life of sacrifice. Now, here's where I think suffering comes in. Where we see it in the book of Acts is that Paul and Simon Peter and James and the early church, they suffered, but not just in their personal journey. They, they had a, you know, a bad week, or they, they had a loss, or they lost their job. or They suffered because they were preaching to people that got angry and persecuted them. They suffered because, you know, Paul would go into a city and they would have a riot over him casting out demons from somebody and they would throw rocks at him. The suffering was all missional suffering. It was not just um, daily struggles. And well, so we, to don't, s- we don't necessarily know if they well, did or well, didn't Well, okay, but the, what's emphasized here, it, I think the heroic kinds of suffering is not the, that you have daily struggles. Suffering for, suffering for Jesus. Suffering for a cause. Yeah. Suffering because you're, 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 you're giving it away. You're, you're, you're laying your life down for others. And I think that that kind of suffering, because you're being persecuted, because you're, 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 you, know, you have chosen to, to so engage with purpose that there is a kickback from that. I think is the kind of suffering that is the heroic suffering that we see in the New Testament. Now, that's not to say God doesn't do things in your life when we suffer, because suffering is just a part of everybody's journey. Um, but I don't think suffering is the is the goal, which I think then on the other side of the equation it can become that. In so the in the poverty gospel, suffering think, becomes the do goal. Do you think God needs to use suffering to build us our character to look like Jesus? Sure. Okay. Talk about talk about that. Let's let's make this balance because I do think that the if if people were hearing us and we sounded very pro word of faith prosperity gospel, they'd be like, I don't think suffering has a place. But you just said you think there is a place for maybe God even intentionally throughout your life will allow suffering. Maybe it's not even while you're on a missionary journey. Maybe it's in your personal life. Um, what what is the role of suffering in general? Does that make sense? Okay. So what? It, let's define it. Give me an example. What's suffering? What does that mean? I think suffering could be anything that causes a lot of personal distress. It, it could be death. It could be sickness. It could be um, some traumatic experience you go through. It could be loneliness. It, I mean, there's a lot of ways that it, it, it could be. It could be people that are around you that are just obnoxious that you have to deal with. Maybe their family, or maybe it's. You know, maybe maybe you married someone who now has it's really gone through a hard time, and 
you know what I mean? And and they're not quite the same person. They're not, they're not the, mm -hmm. their full self. And it's so, so suffering. I think suffering can be anything that's causing you great distress, whether it's physically or emotionally or mentally. Yeah. Okay. So there is this. This is a verse, Romans chapter five, verse three. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. So let's think of it like the athlete training for his event. He suffers ahead of time because he is putting himself through the paces of what it's going to take he or she to compete uh, in the game and have the endurance that they're going to need to succeed. So some suffering is when we fast, when we, when we spend t t extra time in prayer, when we serve, uh, you know, you're a mom or a dad and you're going to serve your family and you're going to set us on your own personal agendas to be able to benefit somebody else. When you, when you suffer because you're t spending your time and resources and energy in, in service of other people. Sometimes so, so it's self -denial, like... self-denial, basically. Okay, self-denial, yeah. So, right. so sometimes it is, I have been betrayed by somebody. I, I poured my life into a marriage, and they, they walked away from me. I, I, uh, I, I, I got into business, and I had a partner who, you know, stole from me. I, I have, I've been pastoring my church, and I have leaders that I never thought would forsake me, and they, they left and when they were criticizing me. Okay, those... Those are all things that are, are I guess, sufferings. There is, there's another great example in, in actually 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, where Paul says, I had all these great revelations from God. He allowed me to be caught up into the heavens to keep me from being proud. He allowed there to be a thorn in my flesh. And then he says, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded to before God to take it away from me. But he said, no, my grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in your weaknesses. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then he said, that's why I delight myself, and he lists five things, in my hardships, in my insults, in my difficulties, in my persecutions, and, oh man, what's the fifth one? In, whatever it happens to be, in my pain, you get the idea. What is that 12? Uh, set for 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you want to look oh, it yeah, up? Yeah, I'll pull it up. And yeah. then he says, because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Okay, so Paul says, he lists them, insults, difficulties, which are impossibilities, hardships, which is like when you try to squeeze through a narrow place and everything is just squeezing you in life. Um, so stresses, difficulties, impossibilities, insults, persecutions, these are all the things that would be in the category of things. And he doesn't glory in them by saying, oh, I'm so glad this is happening to me. <laughs> like, I'm so glad I'm being persecuted. I'm so glad that, man, I've been insulted by somebody. I'm so glad that I'm in the middle of an impossible situation. He glories that even in the pain, God's grace is sufficient and that his power is made perfect in weakness. I keep fat fingering this. I'm like trying to yeah, type okay, stuff so, and it's not working. So 2 Corinthians, oh, Second Corinthians, I was chapter like, I 12, at verse 7. And we're actually, okay. I think, verse 9. Yeah. Um, no, 10. That's why I delight in weaknesses, in insults, <laughs> in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So what he's glorying in, not is that he's in a painful situation, but that the grace of God is greater than and able to sustain him in the midst of, and perfected in him as he's going through that suffering. Absolutely, we believe that suffering has a role in your life. Now, here's where the debate comes in. What is that thorn in the flesh? Right. Because probably the one point that I side with the prosperity teachers on is that I don't think God sends sickness into our life as a way to perfect us. And at, some people will say that this sickness, that this thorn in the flesh for Paul was a sickness. It was his An poor eye eyesight sickness, or yeah. some problem with the stomach or whatever. But he actually tells us what it is. He, he says, it's a messenger of Satan. It's, it's either a demonic attack or it's a person who was uh, being used by the devil to provoke him. Yeah. And so I, I, don't, so I don't see a loving Heavenly Father sending a sickness to make you better can I, as can a I, person. Can I so, just point out the blindness thing that people always say? Yeah. So they, they say, well, Paul says, see with what large letters I write. But he's <laughs> like, it's an <laughs> emphasis point. No, no, where yeah. He's like, I'm like, bolded. Because I can't see it. I have, <laughs> yeah, to, I have to write Use the larger letters. font on my phone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 
was like, what the heck? It's such a weird point. I mean, it's, it's commonly taught. See yeah. what large letters I write. No, I, but yeah, I... I so, Sorry, didn't mean to cut so you off I, I, So what is the reason for sickness? God never created it. He created us to be in perfect health in the Garden of Eden. We will be in perfect health in the kingdom of heaven. So where God always gets his way, there is always health. Now, we live in a cursed world where we know we're going to die. I'm getting older. I know with age comes the breakdown of my physical body. Yeah. I, I, I'm wearing glasses right now because I can't see as well. It doesn't mean that I live in perfected conditions. It just means that I don't think God uses sickness as a tool to build our character. So it is, it c- could it be present in our life and be being used by God because, it, okay, maybe God didn't send it on you or to you, but he uses whatever's present in your life. But for me, I will always keep on praying for healing in any area where there's sickness, believing that that's God's will, because not only did Jesus die and take upon himself the stripes that bring us healing, but I believe that the ultimate will of God eternally is for our health. And so for me, I just stay in that posture of faith. And anytime there's sickness in the world, either I can't explain it, why it's there, or I just blame it on the devil. So let me let me ask some devil's advocate questions. Yes. In the Old Testament, there are several times whenever God uses sickness, more than several, a bunch, when he sends plague or he sends boils or he sends... Not upon you know, his kids. Well, he does on Israel. There's there's a few times when Israel's in rebellion and God... I mean, he literally so, talks about, I'll send you plague I, and famine I would, and pestilence. I would... So now I'm going to give you my spin on it, my theological belief about that. I actually believe that God lifted his hedge, uh, or they walked out from underneath his protection, and therefore the devil had the right to take a shot at them, rather than God, um, out of vengeance, zapped them with a plague. Mm. So I think that God only sends good things our way. Mm. But when we get into a dis- disobedient situation, we expose ourselves to the powers of darkness and the cursed world we live in, in a way. Now, that doesn't mean that every time something breaks in your body, you need to go see the doctor that somehow you're out from underneath the hedge. I'm just drawing... So healing is a mysterious... Sickness and healing is a mysterious question. Yeah. I, I, I have come to a couple of conclusions in my life. So the, like, I really arrived at this when your your brother, our young, our youngest, Jonathan, uh, who contracted diabetes. And that's this. I'm not going to blame God for sickness. I am going to blame the devil. And I am going to keep on asking for healing, believe it's the, believing it's the will of God for healing to come. And when I don't understand what the reasons why, I just will trust him with it, right? So every day I still get up and pray for Jonathan's healing, believing that God is able to heal him. Jesus died for him and can provide healing for him. And when he is suffering, I don't get... Because this is what happens sometimes with the, the glorification of suffering. If God has sent suffering onto my son, that's a really heavy thing to carry. And also... If How do you trust God with something that he has sent? I mean, so for me... And based upon my reading of Scripture, and it also is, I think, a spiritually healthy thing to do, when I see him suffering, I do not get mad at God. I get mad at the devil, because it's what the devil has done to this world that makes people sick, not what God's done. Jesus came to reverse the curse and everything that comes with it. So for me, I have to live in faith because that keeps me in a posture of being able to trust God and believe for the supernatural. Well, I think if God did send that sickness then why would you pray for healing? Why would you? And I, I think so... And so then how would you ever know it's which the, sickness to pray for and which one not to? When you go into the Old Testament, what God does and doesn't send on his kids or not on his kids, it's really muddy and confusing. I think that's one of the reasons why we have to look at But in the New, New Testament, you don't, you don't ever see God... The only instance where you see any explanation for a sickness is this one we just went over and... 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul talks about a thorn in the flesh. If it even is a sickness. Well, I don't think it is, because it's it says it's a messenger. Right. That right. individualizes it, personalizes it. I don't yeah. think it's a sickness. It was demonic, or it was a person, or it was a person that demonic was being demonically used in Paul's life. Sure. Or it, it even could have been like a, a, 
a character weakness or something like that that Paul that was asking God to take away from him that he was maybe he was struggling or I don't know whatever it might have been. Um, I, I think one of the things that I look at whenever I'm thinking through healing and faith and believing for is Jesus going to do this is when you look at the person of Jesus, Jesus always healed everybody he came in contact that was sick. He never said like, well, you need to stay in this a little longer because God's building character in you. Or I mean, every sick person that came to him, all of them were healed. It says that constantly. If you look throughout the Gospels, there was never a time when a sick uh, person or a, a demoniac, somebody who was demonically oppressed or possessed, came to Jesus and he did not bring freedom. Yeah. Right? And, and He didn't say, case, oh, sorry, not this time. The Father wants you to have this. He always responded in a way that was aggressive faith. And Same then, thing is true with the apostles well, okay. all throughout the book so of Acts. Let me, let me point this out. This is one that I that I always would hear, and I was like, what? This is such a weird example. Uh, it's in uh, Acts. It is in Acts chapter... Is it? It might be two. I don't know if it's two. It's whenever uh, Peter and John go by the, the man board blind at the gate. Uh, beautiful, I think is what it is. Uh, well, that's chapter three, and he was... Chapter three, crippled, cri- okay, crippled. Cripple. He couldn't walk. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Wow, yeah. I am really me- mixing up my things. <laughs> yeah. He's crippled, not born blind. Duh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so he's a cripple. I I hear people talk about. Well, that cripple is probably always at the gate that Jesus would walk by. Well, well he probably was. Sure. I, and I. He, so Jesus did not heal him, nor did he heal everybody he walked by. It wasn't like you know, you know, it was like there was this healing zone in every place he went. There was always a personal interaction that involved faith. Yeah, exactly. So for whatever reason, he did not heal this man. But when Simon Peter and and John walk by, they have an encounter with him where healing happens through Jesus, which was through the name of Jesus, right? And, and what what I find crazy about that example is, it's like, well, Jesus didn't heal this guy. For somebody that gets healed by Jesus yeah. a few chapters later, <laughs> right. it's like, well, he still got healed. Yeah. You know, there, there's no example that we find of Jesus not healing somebody or making it God's will for somebody to suffer in a physical disease, injury kind of a way. And obviously, we don't always know why God allows something. Like, I remember the, the example that you talked about with me when I was growing up that really made a big impact is actually... The man born blind that the disciples asked Jesus, why was he born blind? Was it his sin or his parents? And he says, neither. And then sort of he doesn't answer leaves the question. That in the he says, but <laughs> but but now we are here so that God's glory might be demonstrated. Yeah. And he heals the man right then and there. Right. So yeah. We, so yeah, so we, and 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 he said, you know, um I, I've it's been night for a long time, but I've come so that I could dispel the darkness. So his implication was, the, if there is a reason for it, it's because of the darkness that, that, that rules the world and the curse that hangs here. But now the light of the world's here, which is going to reverse this curse. So, so let me, let me, let's come back to prosperity gospel. I believe this. All the emphasis on breakthrough is really great. We, one of our values as a church is to live in aggressive faith. And we want to approach every, every problem in life from a faith point of view. We want to have faith to move mountains. We want to have faith to see sick people healed. We want to have faith to see financial breakthrough. We want to have faith to see your business prosper. We want to have faith to see your dreams come to pass. But not to use for selfish consumption. (laughs) Not so that you can just become the biggest house on the block or be materialistic, but so that you can fulfill the Great Commission and take the gospel to the ends of the earth and serve the poor. If you're constantly in, in in a position of defeat, how can we change the world in a position of doubt and defeat. We have to live in aggressive faith because the world is broken and there are people being abused everywhere we look and there are women being trafficked and there are people without clean water and there are nations that are suffering and there are cities that are struggling and there's an opioid addiction crisis and, and we have to have the resources that we need to be able to take the gospel to the world. And if we live without aggressive faith, how can we be aggressive in accomplishing the purpose. If you're if you're taking aggressive faith and using it for only selfish purposes, then then it gets real materialistic in its motivation and it becomes almost a self-centered gospel. But it's not the faith that's the problem. It's the reason why you want to be blessed. It's the motive for for your faith that is so twisted. And it may be the motive of some of the pastors who are teaching it because they're actually trying to manipulate you to give them more, and they're using these promises to leverage people 
people's um, hopeless situations. I mean, this is really, really horrible when you think about it. There might be a woman sitting at home watching her Christian television program. She's on a fixed income, and you have a guy that's on television flying a helicopter, mm -hmm. and he's trying to get her money from her so that, and using, an, you know, a sort of a twisted version of the promises of God to get her to send her $10 in. I don't, man, that's not good at all. No. And I think that's the part that is really sort of sick about the prosperity prosperity gospel. Well, it's that, and then it's the fact that you can easily go from serving Jesus to serving your own I, I, desires and yeah. materialism. and Because it, God doesn't, I, I think that it's like, are you serving... Are you serving Jesus because you want to be rich or blessed? Like, well, God, like it's like you know, it's it's about if it's about the blessings and not about laying it all down at the foot of the cross. Yeah, it's not really serving Jesus. It's serving a materialism God. Yeah, yeah, and you know, Paul did he did when he wanted to quote his credibility to people that were questioning his apostleship. He didn't say, "Look at the size of my house. Look at the kind of car I drive. <laughs> of look at how much have. money I have. Yeah, yeah look yeah. at my followers on Instagram." He said, "Do you know how many times I've been beaten? Mm -hmm. Do you know how many times I've been stoned? Do you know how how many times I've been shipwrecked? You know how many times I was left for dead? Yeah. How many times I've been hungry in in the in the cause of the gospel?" But those were all missional sufferings. They were not just life has been hard this week. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, do you know how how depressed I've been over the past couple of years? Like, it's not that kind of a thing, right? It's not like glorifying your aches and pains uh, and your struggles. Um, although you can say, look at what God's brought me through. My the the stuff I've walked through in life, the the betrayals that I've experienced, and God's brought me all through this, and now He's healed me, and I'm an instrument now to take the grace I've received from my sufferings and pass it along to somebody else, because even when I was weak, God made me strong. Okay, that's a great story and a great testimony, yeah. but even that is prosperity in a way, because it basically... So the, the 2 Corinthians 7, 12 passage basically says, your power is made perfect in my weakness. Sure. Even, even Paul's talking about his thorn in the flesh comes from a prosperity perspective because it says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Like, it doesn't say, when I'm weak, then I continue to be weak. It said, even through the worst parts of my life, the grace of God was an overcoming grace. And so I think the emphasis always has to be on that, but not for this weird, materialistic, selfish purpose. Well, then I think whatever challenges you are going through or suffering, I think if you have the attitude of, I'm believing for God to give me breakthrough, but even while He hasn't, I'm still going to glorify God because yeah. I know He's being made perfect through my suffering. I think that's the attitude. You know, I, there there is something to that Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you know, our God will save us from the fire about to throw us into, but even if He doesn't, we're still going to follow yeah. Jesus. Like, yeah, or Paul and Silas in the middle of the Philippian dungeon with they've just been beaten, and here they are. They have no idea when they're going to get out, but they worship their way through anyway. Yeah, I mean, that is the perspective. And if you are suffering right now, I want you to hear me say this. God's for you. He, his will is to redeem you. His grace can be made perfect in your weakness. The suffering you're going through can give you perseverance, which gives you hope because it makes your character strong. But He doesn't want you to stay in a position of defeat. He wants you to have the expectation that not only are you going to get through this, you're going to be made perfect through it, and He's going to bring you through on the other side to bring not just breakthrough to you, but through you to other people in the world, because His will is to see His kingdom come on the earth and to overthrow the curse of sin and to break the back of darkness so that we can walk in the victory He's decided, desired for us, not so that we can just live a cushier life but so that we can fulfill his purpose on so earth. So give me give me the balance now, just the straight, like both boundary lines, like a proper theology of prosperity and suffering mixed and balanced. So I think we have to have an extreme belief in the power of the gospel to bring healing and breakthrough and provision. And we also have to have an extreme call upon people's lives to lay their lives down for others in the in the purpose in the service of the gospel. If you have both of those two things together, you'll be living the balance. If all, if you have lost your aggressive faith because you you are overvaluing suffering, then I think you you have lost something you really desperately need. If you're not if you're not rising up to the challenge to give your life for the cause of Christ, 
then you've probably lost something there too. I actually think there are people that don't do either. They're not really doing either. They're not giving the life for the cause of Christ, nor are they living in aggressive faith. They're just being critical of others mm. <laughs> who they think are imbalanced somehow, which is probably the saddest place to be of all, <laughs> all of the places you could be. Um, because at least if you're trying to live in faith, that's a good thing, right? If you're doing it for selfish motives, okay, that's, that's bad. Um, or if you're living for the cause of Christ, and maybe you haven't been believing enough for breakthrough, uh, then that's a good thing. But, but I think both of those things need to be held in balance. Yeah. Can I speak up for one more thing? I don't know. Do we have Go time? Ahead. For, okay. Yeah, we have time. There is one guy that I think it's a little bit unfairly criticized in the prosperity teaching, and that's a guy named Joel Osteen. Mm-hmm. Okay. Joel Osteen oftentimes is the face of a lot of criticism. And I had the chance to meet him when he came to Pittsburgh and hear him describe his, his strategy. So Joel, typically you'll hear him preach a lot of the same message on a regular basis, and it's a message of hope. God loves you. Be positive. He wants to do something in your life. If you'll trust him, he wants to bring you through this, bring you into a better season, a new day. And when he was here in Pittsburgh, I heard him talk about his strategy. He said, my purpose is not to, to, to give people a balanced message. He said, I, I'm on television only to give people hope. He said, I'm not even trying to lead people to faith. He said, hope, you have to have hope before you can have faith. So I'm just trying to give people hope. Now, the stats they told us is actually Joel reaches on television 80,000 households in the city of Pittsburgh, and 40,000 of those households every week are, pe- are from homes where they're not Christians. And so they're, the people are tuning in to hear Joel, not because they're trying to have an American version of the gospel where they have a bigger house and a lot of money, but they're listening to Joel just because they feel like they have nothing left and they just need a positive voice in their life and a little bit of hope. Then Joel said, after we lead people to a place where they have, you know, prayed a salvation prayer or they've told us that they want to follow, they then send them to a local church where they get the balanced teaching. And I think sometimes people misinterpret Joel's strategy and uh, paint him with a very broad brush of somehow being the face of all the evils of the prosperity gospel. When I just think, uh, you know, we were we were actually. Mel and I down in Aruba celebrating our 25th anniversary 10 years ago. And when we were on the beach, we, we were renewing our vows. My dad, by FaceTime, um, kind of walked us through our vow renewal. We had a photographer there. And he said, so what do you, what, what's your job in America? And I said, well, I'm a pastor. And then he said, oh, do you know Joel Osteen? <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, I guess I've met him. He said, could you get him to come to Aruba? And so I was like, well, I don't know him that well. But all over the island of Aruba, they're watching Joel because Joel preaches hope, and he doesn't preach the full balanced diet of Christianity, but he does that on purpose because he's just trying to reach people through a little bit of positivity so that they can, he can, they can lift their eyes out of their problems for a moment. Now, do I think Joel's message or ministry is perfect? No, I'm not saying that at all. Um, you could actually debate whether that strategy is effective or not. One of the things I do know is that He is talking to a lot of people. I mean, millions and millions of people who are listening to him and are at least hearing a little bit of the promises of God, which may lead them into something. So I just wanted to defend Joel. I think sometimes he takes it, he gets a black eye over things. I think he, it really shouldn't be said of him that way. Well, and I think honestly, if if every word I said and ministry was analyzed and like his. <laughs> oh man, I don't even want to know what I'd yeah. be branded. You know what I right. mean? Like, because because I don't think anybody's perfect. Uh, Joel's not perfect. TD Jakes isn't perfect. There's lots yeah. of guys that get lumped into the the prosperity label. Um, and I I don't think any ministry is perfect. Um, I do think one of the things we try to be cautious of is who we blast. Yeah. On here, because I I, I think more often than not, pastors are trying their best, and they're not necessarily perfect. It's far easier to criticize um, than it is to give them the benefit of the doubt and and, and defend. Yeah, and you got to admire anybody who's willing to put themselves out there on television and and be so high profile. Um, and Joel is not on just on Christian TV; he's on secular television programs, and and uh, you know exposing himself to all the criticisms that come with that. And so I just think sometimes he's treated a little bit unfairly. 
as well as I do think that often a lot of preachers who would be seen as faith teachers are lumped in with some who had very bad practices and they just get broad brushed as prosperity teachers. And, and so, again, I think there's a balance to this. There are some really weird things that have happened over time. But then we don't want to lose faith. We don't want to lose aggressiveness in, in terms of our pursuit of the gospel. So that's my little two cents at the end. There it is. <laughs> there it is. And we would love your feedback and your thoughts on, on what you think about this whole topic, as well as if there are other things that you'd like us to discuss. We're always happy to hear uh, what you're interested in hearing about. And we would just be so honored if you would consider liking and subscribing on social media, especially on YouTube. You can share the posts. Uh, you can tell your friends about it. You can leave us a five-star review on your phone or your mom's phone or your spouse's phone. Somebody maybe who doesn't know how to use the podcast app, you can help them leave a five-star review. Any and of those would be greatly appreciated. And stay tuned to find out about the birth of the, the baby, little James. Yeah. Collie. James Collie Leak. Leak. Yeah, looking yeah. forward to that. I'm looking forward to it as well. <laughs> so, hey, we hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you around next time. <laughs>